let's get right into this subject. So back in 2019, I made a trip to Italy and I saw a lot of churches. Um, every day I was walking into numerous churches, churches from uh, the Renaissance, uh, churches from the 16th century, 17th century. I saw churches that were built in numerous different eras. Uh, there were a few churches that I saw that were a little bit weird. Well, a little bit. They were quite weird. Uh, in one church, I saw statues of various popes that were built with gold. These statues, I saw golden statues of popes. <laughs> golden statues of popes. And I saw statues of angels, and these angels are portrayed as little naked boys. And you see this everywhere. Uh, but I saw these statues of popes, and the statues were made of gold. Golden popes. It was weird. It makes you think, okay, this whole church was founded by Jesus Christ, who was a carpenter who slept on the Mount of Olives and lived with his mom. And he rode a donkey. And from that, you go to building statues made of gold. It was, it was bizarre, <laughs> to say the least. Golden statues, not really the most humble thing. It's not the most humble manner by which to uh, portray the uh, successors of St. Peter. And St. Peter was a simple fisherman who would eventually get crucified upside down. And then you would see the statues of naked boys, and these were supposed to be angels, and you would just see them everywhere. And it was just, it was just bizarre. Like, who came up with this idea? Who came up with the idea? Because if you ever read the Bible and you read how the Bible describes angels, it's, it's very difficult to describe how the Bible um, details how uh, an angel looks. Um, but 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 you 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 go to these churches in Italy and you see naked boys with wings. It's just it's just bizarre. The whole thing is bizarre. Um, and then I went into this one church. I think this church was built in the fourteen or fifteen hundreds, maybe even earlier than that. But uh, I walked into this church and there were literally paintings of naked men all over the. Uh, the tops of the of the walls just all over the tops of the walls nearing the ceiling you would see these paintings of naked men and i'm thinking what the hell is this and people would say oh well it, you know these are supposed to be the goths i'm thinking okay why the hell do they have to be naked and why is this on a church <laughs> like why why are these paintings in a church it's just bizarre and in that same church, I walked into another room where they had this large portrait of Dante Alighieri on the wall. And here is the thing about Dante. When you read his Paradiso or his Inferno, they are pagan gods littered all over that literature. I tried reading... Uh, Dante Alighieri years ago. The only thing that I read of his that I kind of enjoyed was his, uh, it was a romantic book. I think it was called uh, The New Life, Nue Vita Nueva, Nueva, I think, something like that. And it was beautifully written. It was a it was beautiful love poetry. And he was obsessed with this woman uh, named Beatrice, and she wasn't even interested in him. She ended up going with some rich guy, and but he was obsessed with her. And all of his books were dedicated to this woman. It's like, come on. I mean, seriously, uh, talk about simping, right? But when you read his Inferno or his Paradiso, uh, it's full of paganism, full of paganism, pagan gods, Aphrodite, and all these go goddesses and all this stuff. And you think to yourself, okay, this is weird. And Renaissance literature is full of this stuff. 
It's full of paganism. And what happened in Europe in the Renaissance period was a revival in interest in paganism. That's what happened during the Renaissance period. Uh, there were people who were within Christendom who were against this this trend, but nonetheless, this trend became a trend. It was very popular. Uh, people were very interested in Greco-Roman mythology and Greco-Roman deities to the point where they would uh, intermix uh, the names of these pagan deities with uh, Christian uh, um, imagery and and uh, and Christian writing, um, and they would fuse together Christian ideas with the names of these deities. And there was a lot of this stuff that was going on. Um, and what it was, was a revived interest in paganism in Europe. It was as if the church didn't really fully get rid of uh, Europe's pagan roots. And this is actually an argument that uh, a lot of neo-pagans make. Uh, there was one neo-pagan, uh, he, he had a a substantial following on YouTube. His name was uh, Varg Vikernes, and Varg Vikernes was a... A Norwegian terrorist, actually, who burned down dozens of churches in Norway. But he ended up making a YouTube channel. Eventually, YouTube took it down because, obviously, the guy, uh, in a in a somewhat sneaky way, he will promote Nazi ideas. Uh, but um, he would say that paganism never really died in Europe. And in a way, he was right. It never really died. That's why the church was always struggling with witchcraft. And the church was always struggling with uh, dealing with the presence of witches. Um, and in the Renaissance period, there wasn't just a revival in, in paganism. There was also a revival uh, in um, occultism. And a lot of it had to do with the entrance of Kabbalism into Europe through Spain. Uh, much of what we today call the Kabbalah has its roots in medieval Spain. Um, and so Kabbalism became very popular, especially amongst the, uh, the intellectual elites. It also became popular within certain members. Uh, it became popular for certain members of the clergy. There were people within the church who were doing it. Uh, they were popular writers who were doing it. Uh, there was one. There was one particular Renaissance writer. His name was Giovanni Piccolella Mirandola, and uh, he was one of the guys that uh, really brought Kabbalism into the mainstream in Europe. So there was all this. There, there were all these weird things that were happening in in old Christendom, and you can see the the footprints of this in the churches in Europe. And I saw this when I was in Italy. In fact, there was one church that I went to in Italy where I saw a, a star of David engraved on the ground outside of the church. And then when I walked into the church, there were literally hundreds of these stars of David all over the floor. They were engraved all throughout the floor of this church. And it makes you wonder, how did that happen? Well, obviously it came from the, uh, the Kabbalistic influence uh, that was very strong in Europe. In fact, much of medieval occultism and magic and Renaissance uh, occultism is rooted in Kabbalism. Uh, there was a book that I remember reading a few years ago. It was on uh, witchcraft, I want to say in the, in the medieval period, and... The book uh, quoted a lot of old spells and quotes from these old occultist books, and there was a lot of weird things that people would do, uh, make shapes on the ground and uh, kill a bird and put its blood on the, on the edges of the circle or something like that. There was a lot of weird things that were being taught uh, in those days. And there was even a whole network of underground uh, monks that were involved in the occult. It was a whole occultist uh, network, and it consisted of members of the clergy. There was a lot of weird stories that I remember reading. Uh, there was one story that I read. Uh, this took place in the city of Orleans in France. I want to say in the 11th century. 
and uh, there was this uh, cult that would get together at night, uh, and uh, they would have orgies. Uh, they would have orgies, and then all of the children that were conceived in the orgy would uh, they would be born, and then they would be used as child sacrifices. They would literally burn the child, the children alive. And the way they would do it is they would take uh, an infant, and then they would play. They, they would they would start this. They they would uh, make this huge uh, fire, and then the the group, the cult, would uh, make a circle. They would form a circle around the fire, and then they would literally play hot potato with the baby. They would just they, they would put the baby out real close to the fire, and they would play hot potato with it, with the with the with the with the, with the infant until the infant was cooked to death. Um, and then they would uh, burn the corpse of the child, and they would take the ashes and they would make a little cake out of it, and that cake became their communion bread. And the reason why we know this is because there was actually a guy uh, who lived at that time period who had a butler who uh, was a member of this cult. He suspected the, uh, the employer of this butler suspected that the butler was involved in some nefarious stuff. He uh, requested permission from the church to be a spy to the cult, and this was this uh, request was granted. He went. Uh, uh, he first entered the cult, uh, pretending to be interested in it. They were very enthusiastic about this because they were always enthusiastic about getting new converts. And in the beginning, it was just teaching. Uh, and then uh, after he stayed in this group for uh, long enough, they said, "Okay, you can now come to the uh, the the more advanced sessions." And the more advanced sessions involved an orgy. And then uh, he saw uh, that the child that the uh, the child would be uh, uh, put through the fire and uh, cooked alive. And then uh, he saw how they would take the ashes and make a cake out of it, and how they would take the little pieces of cake. And the the leader of the cult would say, "This is the true body of Christ." When the church uh, did an inquisition on this group. They uh, arrested the members of this cult, and uh, I'm pretty certain they were members of the clergy that were in this group. Today, we see member members of the clergy who are involved in uh, another uh, insidious activity, and that is the promotion of Sodom. And this has become very prevalent in the Catholic Church to the point where Numerous studies have shown that uh, a huge portion of the priesthood are actually members of Sodom. Uh, we're talking at least 60%, which is a very high number. Uh, and this is, the, this is the whole thing with the Catholic Church. But you see in the old churches, because a lot of people will, will point to the modern problems with the church, and they will say, oh, this is because of Vatican II, oh, this goes back to the 60s, but this is a problem that goes deep. It goes real deep. It goes down the centuries, and you can see in Christendom, in old Christendom, you can see the paganism, you can see the occultism that became popular, you can see it in Dante, but you also see it in the New World as well. Uh, For example, there was uh, there was a painting from 1753. Uh, it's called The Last Supper. It was painted by Marco Zapata, and it is a, uh, a portrait of the Last Supper. Only the disciples are not eating uh, the, the, the communion bread. Uh, they are eating uh, a guinea pig. Yes, a guinea pig. So here is Christ and his disciples, they are around the table. This is the Last Supper. This is one of the most holiest moments recorded in the New Testament. And Christ and, the, and uh, his disciples are eating a guinea pig. And the reason why they are eating a guinea pig is because the guinea pig was considered a holy and sacred animal to the indigenous people who worshipped Pachamama. Uh, the guinea pig is a sacred animal to the cult of Pachamama. And the church in the 18th century did nothing to stop this. 
There was no bishop, no cardinal that came to Mr. Zapata and said, hey, cut this crap out. No, didn't happen. Kind of like how today we have Father James Martin running around promoting Sodom, and the Pope doesn't say, hey, cut this crap out. No, the Pope actually sent a letter to Father James Martin and praised his ministry. Um. So this, this problem runs deep, and this painting was connected with the, the cult of Pachamama, uh, and this old ancient evil uh, that was being done in the church uh, is reflected today in the actions of the Pope himself, when Pope Francis has Pachamama right in front of him, and they have all of this indigenous paganism being done. And you have the people, and you know, they're the, the indigenous people, and they're dressed up in their tribal attire, and it's just, it's just insanity. The whole thing is insanity. I wouldn't be surprised to one day see a pope in Ukraine, and uh, somebody offers a statue of the goddess of the god Perun or something, and they have women with flowers on their hair, and they're dressed up like the, those people in that movie Midsummer, and they say, "Oh, look, Perun, blah blah blah," you know, and and. and and then, and then comes the sophistry, you know, and then comes the sophistry, the deception, the gaslighting. You have these people who come out and say, well, the church has a very long history of this. Pachamama could be used as a symbol of the Virgin Mary. You know, there's a limit to this. There is a limit to this. For example, Europeans, Westerners, people all over the world put Christmas trees in their houses every year. They put Christmas trees in their houses. Now, the Christmas tree has become a symbol of, for Christianity. In the past, trees were used for paganism, for pagan um, festivities or whatever. Uh, and we took the, this idea and we Christianized it. We made it our own. Now, that was a victory over paganism. Uh, for example, and we can see this in the New Testament in the, in the book of Acts chapter 17, where St. Paul is preaching to the pagans of Greece, and he says, um, in Acts chapter 17, uh, he says, uh, talking about Christ, um, in him do we, it's something like, in him do we, do we move and live? Um, actually, I want to, I actually want to get the right, I, I don't want to misread it. It says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And this is from Acts chapter 17, verse 28. And people will, the fact is that St. Paul took these lines from a pagan writer. Uh, the, when the pagan writer wrote these words, he was talking about Zeus. He was saying, in Zeus do we live and move and have our being. And what St. Paul did was he took these words and he applied them to Christ. He said, and essentially saying, to hell with Zeus, it is in Christ that we live and move and have our being. Not in Zeus. But you see, the sophists of the Catholic Church come out and they say, oh, look, he took these pagan lions and he Christianized it. You see, so we can do all these other things. We can have Pachamama, we can do these other things if we want to. And it's like, no, you can't just do that. What Paul was doing was he was basically saying, to hell with Zeus. It is in Christ that we live and move and have our being. This is like, you know, my father... Uh, my father did a similar thing when he preached in a Buddhist temple. Years ago, my dad preached in a Buddhist temple in Los Angeles. I was there. We went into a Buddhist temple, and there were all these Buddhists in Los Angeles. And my my dad said, uh, you know, you, you can say that Buddha is your samurai, but let me tell you about my samurai. And my dad started talking about Christ. He used the word samurai, which is you know comes from Japan, and the samurai were pagans. They were Zen Buddhists and Shintoists. But my dad took that word, and he said, well, let me tell you about my samurai, Jesus Christ. In other words, to hell with your Buddha, to hell with your paganism. I want to talk about Jesus Christ. Um, you can take a line from the Quran uh, that describes God, and you can say, well, you know, Allah is most compassionate, but let me tell you something about Jesus Christ, who is most compassionate. You could you could use the same sort of uh, sort of uh, articulation. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but they are. But you see, people take that and they uh, they use it to justify whatever they want, and from that point, they 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 use it to, to justify religious anarchy. 
So how about I just take a statue of uh, Bab Homet, who's the devil, and say, well, you know, uh, uh, I want to uh, use this uh, to represent Jesus Christ, and you use some sophistry to justify that somehow. I don't know how you would do it, but let's say you do. Let's say you pull that off. Well, you you you, you can use these arguments to justify anything. Let's just take uh, I don't know a statue of Zeus and say, well, actually, it represents God, and you know He is the King of Heaven, and you know God created the heavens, and so. How far do you want to go? Do you want to take paintings of Jesus in the Last Supper eating a guinea pig and put that in every church in the world? Would you like that? It's insanity. The whole thing's insane. But the problem runs very, very deep. It's not just Vatican II. This problem is ancient within the Catholic Church. Anyway, you guys just heard some theology. God bless.